of the budget. Uh, once he's complete, he'll take questions and he will be moderating the discussion. Please limit it to one question and one follow-up that allows everybody an opportunity to try to get a question. So without further ado, Colonel Holland. So good afternoon. Uh, great to be back here again and see some familiar faces here. And uh, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to you the overview of the Army's 2018 uh, budget request. Uh, more importantly, I will tell you I am uh, even more so pleased to be able to continue to serve our great country in uniform as an Army soldier. Uh, so that's always something that inspires me. Um, I'll take a few minutes here and um, in the process of providing an overview of what the Army is doing today, I'll sketch out the current operating environment, uh, what our fiscal posture has looked like over the last five to six years, and how this request supports the administration's and the Army leadership's uh, priorities. And then, of course, I'll spend some time providing a by appropriation review of some of the details of the Army's request. America's Army is increasingly more and more active in worldwide operations across the globe. I would offer to you that the current pictorial on the slide before you not only represents some of the current operations where Army forces are heavily engaged, but it should remind us all of the velocity of instability across the world and how this same pictorial will continue to change in the years to come. This observation alone makes it increasingly clear that the ability to simultaneously conduct decisive action major combat operations while maintaining our counterinsurgency competencies for the current fight represent the most demanding challenge that the Army faces. Properly resourced and trained, a ready Army can perform successfully across this full spectrum of operations, but it must also continue to advance its capacity and capabilities for tomorrow's conflicts. Today, ground forces remain the most globally committed U.S. military force, with more than 180,000 U.S. Army soldiers from the active component, the National Guard, and the Reserve committed to combatant command missions in over 140 countries worldwide. America's soldiers directly contribute to our nation's efforts to defeat ISIS, support governance in Afghanistan, and deter conflict throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. The steady demand for trained and ready Army units provides our nation with the ability to defeat adversaries, assure our allies, and deter potential aggressors. While this chart depicts current operations where America's Army is engaged, the next fight could represent an existential strategic challenge posed by peer powers. Some with nuclear capabilities, advanced technologies, and large and more sophisticated militaries. While it is difficult to define with precision the character of future warfare, its broad outlines can be anticipated. We should plan on all domains of warfare being contested, a technologically sophisticated and numerically superior enemy that initially possesses positional advantage. These anticipated attributes of future warfare demand a continued investment not only in current competencies, but the Army's future capacity and capabilities in order to protect America's national security interests both today and tomorrow. Conducting current operations, sustaining current readiness, and making progress towards a more modern, capable, and lethal future Army will require predictable and consistent funding year to year. The Army's FY18 request takes important steps to improve readiness and close some vulnerability gaps while supporting the groundwork for a future force ready to face the changing threats of tomorrow. Yeah, it's valuable to start by looking at the Army's budget over time <clears throat> and providing a little commentary that may inform your views of the Army's current funding request. As you can see clearly from the chart, the Army's base budget has been on the decline since 2012, while inflation during the same time period has averaged between 1 and 2.5%. The recently enacted FY17 Defense Appropriation Act and the FY18 request represents an upturn in the Army's suppressed top-line funding since the implementation of the Budget Control Act and starts to arrest the Army's readiness decline and sets the conditions for improving the current and future readiness of the force. The base budget represented on this chart, and as you know, is meant to man, train, and equip the nation's army has been significantly impacted by the Budget Control Act as this optic depicts. 
Fortunately, the Army's been able to maintain some current war fighting readiness with the flexibility provided through two bipartisan budget agreements and the OCO funding provided by our government. The market decrease in our base funding level over the past few years had forced the Army to mortgage long-term investments for the benefit of near-term readiness. Likewise, in OCO, not fully represented on this chart, as large contingency operations have become smaller, the Army's OCO budget has been reduced consistent with the requirements of the contingency operations we are supporting. As is clearly portrayed on this chart, the funding levels of the recently enacted 17 budget and this 18 base request are consistent with the administration's goals for the U.S. Army to rebuild readiness, reverse end strength reductions, and prepare for future challenges. With this FY18 President's budget submission, the following are some of the main highlights of our request. First and foremost, the budget has been formulated to provide the combatant commands with the best trained and ready land forces that we can generate. <coughs> to do that, we must fully fund the counterterrorism and counterinsurgency competencies necessary for the current fight, while also building decisive action capabilities for potential major combat operations consistent with the threats that some near-peer nation states may pose. That requires the Army to increase its global responsiveness capabilities and support regional engagements and partnership activities with our allies. The budget request further sustains a force of 1 million and 18,000 soldiers across the total Army with realistic and specialized training and the best maintained equipment we can provide. We were able to focus some of our resources on the Army's installations and infrastructure needs to better support the operations and training of the force. With this budget, we are able to sustain the Army's modernization programs and invest in programs to advance soldier and technological overmatch capabilities. We do all this while seeking to achieve the highest levels of accountability and stewardship to maximize the purchasing power of the Army's budget. This budget and those that follow should provide the Army the necessary resources to conduct current operations, improve current readiness, and make progress towards a more modern, capable, and lethal future Army, provided predictable and consistent funding is available in a timely manner and at a funding level commensurate with current and future demands on the force. The topical discussion that follows highlights both the priorities we use to formulate the budget and the components of this 2018 budget request to achieve senior leader priorities and objectives to achieve the U.S. Army's ultimate goal of remaining the best led, equipped, and most ready ground force in the world. The Army's base budget request is $137.2 billion, an increase of almost $7 billion over the FY17 enacted amount for the base. As you should observe with that margin of growth, there are notable increases in military pay, O&M, or operations and maintenance, and infrastructure to support the larger end strength. This slide represents funding requirements for all three components of the Army, the regular Army, the National Guard, and the Army Reserve, and is a breakout in the aggregate across the major defense appropriations. We will talk about each appropriation in more detail on subsequent slides, however, I take this opportunity to point out at the aggregate level where much of the growth is represented. The 2017 National Defense Authorization Act reversed the previously planned in strength decline and authorized a total Army in strength of 1,018,000 soldiers. A much appreciated start to ensuring the Army has fully manned formations. The increase in this FY18 request goes to covering the readiness requirements of that growth, both military pay and funding for training the force. Additionally, the Army was able to leverage the growth to address recurring readiness shortfalls, primarily in our O&M funded operations in the areas of training and infrastructure. Only a small portion of the growth remained to apply to our future modernization accounts. I will walk you through the details in subsequent discussions. So I'll start with our, um, our mail PERS account. Uh, this slide provides you a clear picture of Army end strength levels and how they remain stable from 17 as the land force requirement could presumably continue to increase the demands on the land force requirement. Many of you are aware that the U.S. Army end strength has declined markedly in recent years across all three components. The Army accordingly had to reduce its force structure to, 
avoid building a hollow army. With the recently authorized increase to the 1,018,000 level, the Army has been able to increase personnel readiness, fill some holes in its formations, and source some of the necessary force structure changes. The FY18 budget request maintains this increased in strength. The Army will achieve this increase through enlisted and officer accessions and retention. Funding associated with these necessary retention efforts is represented on the following slide. Military personnel appropriation accounts for the largest portion of the Army's base budget. Our request funds a multi-component Army of just over a million soldiers and covers pay, allowances, recruiting and retention incentives, permanent change of station moves, and mandates for some training in the reserve components. Given our initial in-strength ramp in FY17 and subsequent reversal and full sustainment in 18 of the 1,018,000 force level, you can see that our request is a full $2.8 billion higher than the FY17 enacted amount. Both the Army's increased in strength and the rate increases in our soldiers' basic pay, housing allowance, and subsistence account for this growth. I will now transition to the Army's operations and maintenance appropriations. As I mentioned earlier, this is one area where we are requesting growth from the current year's budget. Starting with the regular Army, the 2018 budget request totals $38.9 billion and seeks to resource a more balanced readiness across the force. This readiness is more than being prepared for current day contingency operations, but includes readiness for decisive action missions with the capability to conduct major combat operations. This fuller spectrum of readiness is reflected in the Army's 19 combat training center rotations for which we are seeking funding. These rotations are focused on decisive action training for both regular Army and reserve components. The Army's request also provides for critical funding for regional engagement activities with our allies and strategic partners for training missions such as Pacific Pathways, of which some of you are familiar with. This request will cover the sustainment of the Army's equipment and represents a small increase in depot maintenance to help bring our equipment to a greater level of repair and by enhancing Army preposition stocks that will improve global responsive capabilities. This request strongly supports base operation support requirements on the Army's 74 major installations, funding it at a 98% at 98% of the critical requirement. Fortunately, we were also able to increase facility sustainment funding from 67% of the critical requirement of last year to 75% for this, for this year. These funding levels are consistent across all three Army components, and while they represent an improvement over recent years, we still assume risk across our installations, as a large amount of backlog maintenance still exists across the force. The Army's 2018 budget request supports a $10.2 billion O&M requirement for the Army National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve. <clears throat> for the Army National Guard, its 2018 O&M request is also nominally higher than its 2017 funding level. Consistent with the regular Army, it seeks to restore readiness and base operations support, as well as provide funding to continue supporting family and soldier programs that promote the well-being of the Army's most valuable asset, our people. For the U.S. Army Reserve, their $2.9 billion O&M budget request supports 77 functional brigades, its three installations, over 840 reserve centers, and the professional education and specialized skills training for its 199,000 soldiers. Having spent a few minutes discussing Army near-term readiness and manning the force, let's now transition to Army modernization. The Army's FY18 Research, Development, and Acquisition budget request of $26.8 billion represents an increase of $600 million from the FY17 enacted level. That's an enacted level that includes uh, a pretty sizable uptick uh, because of the amendment that was recently uh, included in the FY17 Appropriation Act. However, I would say that the majority of this uh, increase is more so in research development 
uh, testing and evaluation than it is in the procurement accounts, as you'll see. This budget request represents the modernization priorities that we must pursue in order to advance material solutions that enable the Army to retain our advantage against advanced adversaries and to address a broader range of potential threats. This request prioritizes the requirements necessary to deter and, if required, defeat near peer adversaries. The Army is accepting risk in developing of new capabilities in order to prioritize incremental upgrades of our ground and air systems so that we can put in the hands of our soldiers in the near term a, a greater and more lethal capability. In the upper right-hand quadrant of the chart, you will see a list of the Army's top ten modernization priorities. And I'm going to break script here. This is a really important uh, list here that uh, as I go through the remainder of this briefing, you're going to see me kind of go in order here based upon these top ten priorities. But these are really important um, as, as you try to understand how we, we made some choices uh, across our modernization portfolios. These were developed as a result of the strategic portfolio analysis review process to prioritize limited modernization funding in order to balance near-term readiness requirements against long-term force development. We call this the SPAR. The SPAR process allows Army leaders to review and address our most critical capability gaps in order to make informed decisions within the existing resources. In the next two charts, I will highlight how our budget request supports these priorities. The lower right pie chart shows the Army's 11 largest equipment portfolios. What I'd ask you to take away from this is that the Army requires a broad, comprehensive set of modernization efforts in order to successfully execute the diverse missions the combatant commanders require. So let me transition to the procurement portion of our uh, research development and acquisition or our modernization portfolios. Our FY18 request of $17.4 billion is consistent with what we saw in 18, if not just a slightly below that, or 17, excuse me. As mentioned in the previous slide, in this budget request, the Army has focused its modernization efforts within the 10 priority areas. These priorities will ensure we allocate resources to sustain and upgrade the most important weapon systems, munitions, and other critical equipment our units required for a near peer fight. I will now highlight, I will now provide highlights for these 10 priorities. Starting with air and missile defense, the air and missile defense and the long range fires represent the Army's most urgent and pressing capability needs. Given the possibility of confronting a force with substantial anti access and area denial capabilities, the Army needs to advance its short range air defense and long range fires capabilities. This budget request includes funding for several critical air and missile defense systems to include the procurement and installation of 131 Patriot modification kits and the investment in the Avenger surface-to-air missile system supports and interim modernization plan. In the area of long-range fires to improve our ability to respond effectively to surface-to-surface -surface fires for cannon and rocket artillery and missiles, this budget request includes funding for three of the Army's most critical fire systems. The service life extension of 121 expired ATACMS missiles, adding another 10 years of service life to them. The procurement of 6,000 guided multiple launch rocket systems and the continued low rate initial production of 93 Patriot missile segment enhancements. The budget accounts for both the Army's operational and training munitions requirements consistent with the efforts to increase our inventory of munitions in 2017. The 2018 request will help ensure the availability of critical munitions for the combatant commands. Three areas to highlight include the increased production of over 88,000 unguided Hydra 70 rockets, 48, 480 rounds of war reserve inventory replenishment for the Excalibur, and the modernization of ammunition industrial facilities to improve munition production place depleted stocks and create capacity for increased future demand. For example, the Army is pursuing a multi-year effort to improve the Holston Army Ammunition Plant in Tennessee, which will benefit all of the armed services. In the area of mobility, lethality, and protection of our maneuver formations, the Army has developed a combat vehicle modernization strategy 
for the Abrams, Stryker, Bradley, Armored Multi-Purpose Vehicle, or the AMP-V, and the Howitzer Fleets. This includes upgrades to both the Bradley and Abrams platforms and procurement of 42 low-rate initial production AMP fees. Additionally, for the Paladin Integrated Management System, the request procures full-rate production of 59 sets comprised of the self-propelled howitzer and the tracked ammunition carrier. The request procures commercially available active protection systems for the Abrams tank for installation on vehicles within our armored brigade combat team in Europe. On today's battlefield, the Army requires a greater ability to conduct electronic warf warfare against its near-peer adversaries and requires an electronic warfare capability at the brigade level and below. The Army's needs for EW are primarily funded with RDT&E dollars. However, this request does include some other procurement funding to support the integration of the profit system on striker and MRAP vehicles. The Army is committed to eliminating network infrastructure capability gaps within the next 24 months and will procure new systems when possible to support network modernization. These include the Joint Battle Command Platform and the Warfighter Information Network Tactical, which will enable more secure communications from company to core level. The budget request sustains the Army's aviation portfolio capacity and capability to address near-term threats and improve overall aircraft survivability by procuring H-64s, 60s, and 47 aircraft. For the H-64 Echo Apache, this request procures 13 new builds, and it also funds, uh, provides advanced procurement and full rate production of 48 reman aircraft, excuse me. The UH-60M model Blackhawks funding will procure 48 reman aircraft. And the request for the CH-47 Chinook funding will procure four G model and two F model new builds. So now let me transition to uh, RDT&E, or Research Development Testing and Evaluation Appropriation uh, for the Army. It is requesting a $9.4 billion request. And as you can see, that's about a billion dollars above what was enacted in FY17. This enables the Army to prioritize the incremental upgrade of existing systems over new starts so that we can put technologically advanced equipment and more lethal weaponry in the hands of soldiers sooner. The FY18 request includes $2.4 billion for science and technology funding for weapons and munitions advanced technology, which will demonstrate a mobile high-energy laser system to defeat multi multiple threats at the tactical range. It will fund advances in combat vehicles and automotive technology, which will inform the next generation of combat platforms. And it funds aviation advanced technology efforts, which will provide transformational capabilities and component technologies for future vertical lift. Turning towards engineering, manufacturing, development efforts, here are some important focus areas within the top 10 priorities that we've described. In the area of uh, integrated air and missile defense, again, our number one priority um, for air and missile defense for the tactical forces in a contested environment. Within the rdt &E portfolio, we are investing in the Stinger, product, the Stinger Product Improvement Program, the Patriot Product Improvement Program to continue software improvements, and the ongoing risk reduction tests, limited user tests, and upgrades to existing assets to support developmental testing at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. To advance the Army's long-range fires capability, we are investing RDT&E funds to increase the range, volume of fire, and the precisions and guidance of our cannon and missile systems, and to further enable precision fires in a GPS-denied environment. This includes a next-generation, common, low-drag, guided, hypervelocity cannon artillery projectile capable of multiple, multiple missions across different artillery systems. It includes an ATACM's product improvement program that focuses on safety, cost reductions, reliability, deficiency corrections, standardization, and a new improved operational capability. To improve mobility, lethality, and protection of vehicles and weapon systems, we are pursuing cost-effective replacements of obsolete vehicles and improvements of proven platforms. These leading efforts in this area are prototyping and system level testing of the AMP-V, 
a third generation forward-looking infrared and ammunition data link for advanced multiple purpose rounds for both the Abrams tank and the Bradley fighting vehicle, excuse me. <clears throat> Our commercial and military global positioning systems are susceptible to jamming and spoofing. The Army requires both standalone and embedded capabilities to ground and air platforms, communications, weapon systems, and munitions to combat this threat. And the assured positioning, navigation, and timing can provide these capabilities. In the area of electronic warfare, I covered previously when I spoke about the uh, procurement portion of our portfolio, but in the area of electronic warfare and in response to the U.S. Army Europe's so operational needs, we will provide planning capabilities to coordinate, manage, and deconflict the use of electro electromagnetic spectrum and synchronized sy spectrum uh, operations. The, new, the newly established Rapid Capabilities Office is working with program managers and other stakeholders to rapidly deliver an integrated electronic warfare capability to the tactical force and accelerate the development of assured P&T capabilities as well to enable ground maneuver in a GPS-denied environment. Defensive cyber operations enables global, regional, and local cyberspace defenders to conduct mission planning and protection measures. In the area of cyber, our RT, RDT and e efforts are centered on the Persistence Cyber Training Environment program that supports cyber training ranges for both initial and unit level training, proficiency, and certification. In this final RDT and e priority category of vertical lift, we are continuing to improve the turbine engine program, the Chinook product improvement program, and the Apache product improvement program that continues the development of the H64 Echo capability version 6 configuration. This chart lists programs valued at greater than $200 million that represent the Army's major investments in the top 10 modernization priorities with requested procurement quantities for each. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, for your study, uh, but I just wanted to give you an appreciation for some of the, the, the procurement quantities here. So let me transition to our facilities. Uh, one, of the key, one of the keys to readiness is installation readiness and investing in the Army's infrastructure. I discussed previously during the O&M portion of this briefing the Army's investment in the restoration and modernization of its existing facilities. The Army's MILCON or new construction continues to be funded at a comparatively low level, although markedly more than last year. As you can see, there is growth in the FY18 level compared to FY16 and 17, but it is still one of the smallest MILCON's budgets in recent years as the Army will fund 37 construction projects totaling $1.2 billion with this request. In the Army Family Housing Account, which totals $529 million, there is some growth primarily to support an additional six projects totaling $183 million at, at various locations. And lastly, the Army's FY18 BRAC funding supports environmental cleanup, restoration, and conveyance of excess properties at previously BRAC locations. Within the Army's budget request are several requirements that are managed and funded separately outside the main appropriations. This year's request includes almost $71 million for the Arlington National Cemetery. This goes to funding its day-to-day -day operations and there are 29 restoration and modernization projects for this, uh, for the Arlington National Cemetery. The Army is also requesting $962 million for the congressionally mandated chemical demilitarization program. FY18 funds support continued plan operations in both Pueblo, Colorado and Bluegrass, Kentucky. As many of you are aware, the Army's been managing large overseas contingency operation budgets since, uh, since 2001. This has been an account that has ebbed and flowed as contingency operations have expanded and contracted over time. The Army's 2018 OCO budget request represents requirements in military personnel, operations and maintenance, and research development and acquisition. This year's multi-component request totals $28.9 billion dollars. The 2018 OCO request supports Operations Freedom Sentinel and the CENTCOM AOR, Operation Spartan Shield, Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq, the European Reassurance Initiative in Europe. The request also includes 4.9 billion dollars for the Afghan Security Force Fund, 
and $1.8 billion for the counter ISIL train and equip requirements. Uh, this is a fund that now replaces both the Iraq and the tr uh, Syria train and equip fund. The $2.9 billion mil purse portion of this OCO request primarily supports mobilized reserve component soldiers and maintains the current in strength levels in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I know there was some discussion uh, in, in the previous um, uh, with with Mr. Roth and General Iardi up here. Right now, this, this request just covers what is currently uh, authorized and we have there in theater. The operations and maintenance portion represents almost two-thirds of the Army's OCO request and supports theater operations and support, transportation, force protection, support contracts, mobilization requirements, and resetting of equipment returning from theater. And a smaller portion of the request in our procurement accounts is for replacement of battle losses, ammunition consumption, and prepositioned stocks in Europe, so in support of ERI. So I'd like to take a moment uh, because uh, ERI has become such a, uh, a pretty sizable portion of the OCO request, so I provide you a pictorial there. But this A-team request uh, represents about $3.2 billion to continue investing in the European Reassurance Initiative of course, demonstrating the United States' resolve and commitment to the territorial integrity of the 28 uh, NATO member nations. The request, excuse me, the request increases Army's presence in Europe by rotating a full armor brigade combat team, a combat aviation brigade minus, a divisional mission command element, and its key supporting enablers. Additionally, the Army is enhancing European posture by continuing pre-position equipping efforts that were started in FY17 to eventually achieve an end state of two full ABCTs, a division headquarters, and key enabler equipment sets. These prepositioned equipment sets increase the Army's strategic mobility and reduce U.S. response time in the event of a contingency operation. The Army is also resourcing additional European training exercises aimed at demonstrating U.S. capabilities to deploy combat power to Europe on short notice and seamless integration operational capabilities with our NATO partners. As you can see from this request, the budget addresses a vast complexity of requirements needed to restore and rebuild America's Army for today and tomorrow's missions. It represents a balance between the size of the force, the current readiness requirements, and the necessary investment in modernization to ensure our Army remains the premier ground force of the future capable of protecting the national security interests of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, your Army's FY18 request seeks to satisfy the objectives and the themes laid out previously in this briefing and restated on this final slide. I thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions at this time. Yes, sir. Oh, we got them. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned you're moving kind of towards updating legacy platforms and away from new starts. Is that the ground mobility vehicle and mobile protected firepower vehicles? Uh, last year were new starts that were supposed, uh, I guess, priorities for infantry brigades. Are those gone now? Has that been terminated? No, no, no. They're, they're not gone. They're just not a new start anymore for this year. So there is some funding for those. So it sounds like you're focusing a bit on at least the things you mentioned. Um, updating armor brigades as opposed to anything else. Is well, that it's consistent with, uh, you know, not just maintaining the, the counterterrorism and the counterinsurgency competencies that we have, but we really need to have a more robust uh, uh, capability for a major force-on-force -force combat operation with near-peer competitors and those that have some pretty sizable armor formations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, General. The um, aviation uh, programs, I mean, there's a little bit of a cut in, in a few of the programs. Was that necessary to fund the, uh, the other priorities like air defense and uh, munitions? So you're, you're absolutely right. There was a, a balance, and a balance that was meant to satisfy in priority order those, those top ten priorities. So, uh, you know, our aviation portfolio is one of the biggest uh, of, our, of our entire modernization program. I think it accounts for about 25 percent. So, yes, when, you know, when we were balancing between all of these, the complexity of, of all these different priorities, so uh, there were certainly a couple of, of, of things there that uh, we chose to fund as opposed to, to more aviation capabilities. As far as the priorities in general, I know that the leadership always says 
that the size of the force is not as important as how trained and how well trained and equipped mm -hmm. they are. So at what point do you have to stop growing the size of the army to be able to get the resources to train and equip the forces? So I, I would tell you, um, you should ask that question probably after we complete the uh, strategic readiness review that's ongoing. I believe we'll have some, some better information on what the, the true size of the force needs to be once we complete that, and I understand that'll be probably later in the summer when we actually have that. Uh, yes, sir. I'll get everybody, I promise. Yes, sir. Uh, Scott Moss, Yoning Federal News Radio. Um, where does the readiness money at this point get you to where to fulfill your needs? You know, I mean, obviously this readiness is not a, as this been a motif through this, it's not a one-year thing. So where does this get you to? Could more money get you somewhere else, or is this what you can just do in a year? So uh, more money could do better for us. However, I would tell you it's not just money. It's, it's time. So it takes a lot uh, of time to, because readiness is, is, is very much a, an accumulative dynamic, right, a cumulative dynamic. Um, what we m more need than anything else is to have the consistent funding from year to year at, at a level that is consistent with the readiness we're trying to achieve. So right now, if we continue to perpetuate this, this funding level over a continuum of time, then we'll be able to achieve the, the level of readiness that we're, uh, we're trying to get to by 2021-22 time frame. Sir. Yes, Dan Parsons with Defense Daily. If your goal is to increase the armor capabilities of your brigades for a peer-on-peer -peer fight, why the reduction in Abrams mods from 60 to 20? Is that because of availability of platforms, or is that a, a true reduction? So uh, I'll have to get back to you. We, uh, but I'll have to get back to you on, the, on that specific answer, OK? Yes, ma'am. The total dollar amount uh, might be for um, funding the two security force assistance brigades that are mentioned. Um, and I saw a line item that mentioned 848 million for combatant command support, and so I wondered if that might be it or, or where to find. So, the so that that that's not it. So these two S fabs are listed a little over a thousand people. So basically, when you talk about a, a uh, an S fab brigade or two of them. Uh, you're basically just talking about the, the pay and entitlements and uh, of of the of the individuals. There's not a sizable amount of equipping or anything that associated with building those SFABs right now. Do you know, do you have the total dollar amount? Yeah, uh, I, I do. I had it with me earlier today. I'll get it for you okay. at the and end of this briefing. Quickly, um, is there a plan in the Palm potentially to create more of these brigades, or? Do you know? So we, we've had a lot of dialogue about that. I will tell you that um, I think once again. Uh, we need to wait until the Department of Defense finishes its, its strategic readiness review before we can talk about anything beyond what's actually in the FY18 budget request right now. And just a quick point of clarification, you, you had said that um, the Iraq Train and Equip Fund has, was zeroed out and it basically moved to the counter ISIS, ISIS Train and Equip Fund. Yes, okay. Just yeah, both that and the Syria Train and Equip Fund. So that's now lumped as one. It's all lumped into one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, James Drew from Aviation Watch. Gotcha. Um, the uh, Lakota the, attracts about, I think, $100 million or so in the, in the procurement budget. Um, are you able to say how many aircraft that buys and uh, maybe what the Army strategy is going forward for that uh, light utility helicopter program? Um, I, I, I can get you the exact number. The number 19 comes to mind, but I'm not, don't, don't, don't take that as a bona fide certainty right now until that, I get to over and above the uh, original requirement that the Army originally had so you're continuing to buy Lakotas going forward yeah we I think I think there is a move afoot here to buy more than we had initially projected to, 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 to acquire you had Courtney you had a question yes. um, I'm just wondering what the rationale is for placing so much of the vehicle funding in the OCO account I noticed particularly if Bradley basically all the Bradley mod funding is there along with um, a substantial share of the, the Abrams upgrades and, and so on so uh, because our, our, our primary focus uh, is for the, the, the Brads and the Abrams there in Europe uh, and building out the two, the two APS, the ABCT. So putting it, putting it there is probably um, the, right, the right place to put it because it's going to initially be applied to those, those fleets. 
separate, so those will be applied to APS in Europe, uh, for Europe, uh, as opposed to going into units that are rotated in, or? So I think it, uh, initially, yes, it'll go towards the, the, the ABCTs there in Europe. Um, I'll get you, probably need to look a little deeper into that before, to, to give you a more complete answer, but right now I know that's where the priority is. Sure, this will be your last question. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about what was the bill, what's the ARM for the 18 budget to grow? The ARM, the Congress directed you to grow by 50 grand, mm -hmm. 50,000, I guess, 26 mm -hmm. in the act. What's the bill this year, and what's the bill in the FIDUB? Dollar for dollar, I mean, how much more does the, does the Army have to get to sustain the, the growth in this year? So to grow to grow the army from as, as, as you're well aware we were in a we were in a pr pretty well we were going down to 450 we're 476 and so uh, right now be fully burdened costs we project it to be about 2.8 billion dollars uh, for the the entire 26,000 that you're uh, referring to that that includes the training money the installation support and the, the that was what we costed that out to be. 18, and is that going to be annually then through? So we will obviously we'll have to have an increased or a a funding level commensurate with that growth in in the continued years. So I don't see it go. It won't grow more, but it'll certainly to sustain that level, we have to have that 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 increased amount of money. Because that's the bill going forward that you're going to have to keep. You're going to have to pay for in the budget in the in future budgets. That roughly 2.8 billion. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, on the AM, the AMP, the AMPV, is the plan still to accelerate about 65 of those to Europe as part of the European insurance? There is, system? yeah, there is an acceleration component in this in this request for 18. I don't know if it's exactly 65, but I think you got the number right. Can you say from uh, you know from X from 2020 to 2819 or you know what the acceleration is? Or so let me, let me double check. I think it, I think it was a one year okay. acceleration uh, increment. But let me let me double check on that for you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. If you have follow up questions, please see Mr. Wayne Hall, and he will work those for you to get back to to, Mr. to General Hall. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.